So Peter, tell us where you grew up. I grew up in a little place called Wheel Maringle. It's west of Burke. Um, it's about a five hour, six hour drive from Dubbo. Still very remote little place. Yeah. Like it's on the, it's a tributary off the Darling River. It's the Kulgoa River. And the little river ran right next to our mission. And so with the, you went over a little levee and you dived in the river. Um, I thought it was a big river <laughs> until I took my kids back there when they were teenagers and you could walk across it and not get your feet wet. Um, and they said, Dad, where's this big river you grew up on? Uh, um, it's a very sad little community though now, brother. It's a very small little remote community. Um, all those old people are gone. Everything's changed. Yeah. Nothing stays the same. Yeah. But the love for my people is still there. Yeah. Did you say it was a mission station? Yes, a mission station. So when the Australian New Zealand Wool Company was setting up wool in the outback in the early days, uh, Will Maringle was one of the communities that was uh, identified because the, 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 the community is right on the banks of a, the river. It's yeah. a tributary off the Darling. The water is, was sufficient. And the people live there because the water was there. Yeah. And it, even in the most severest of droughts, that water was there to sustain people. And um, so it was, a, 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 you know, it was an obvious choice for, yeah. to grow wool. Well, that meant uh, lots of uh, work for our people in the, in the, in the main. Uh, my family were all shearers. Mm. Uh, so I grew up in the shearing industry as well, as we all did. We do, the shearing shed is built on the community. You look back now, was it, was it a good childhood? I get asked that question a lot, and it was the toughest childhood. It was uh, not a great community to grow up in. Uh, you, had, you had your structure in your family, but it's very remote. We never had a police station. And when you get remoteness and you mix in grog uh, with that, just ask the women and children. It was awful. Yeah. Awful time, but you still had your family, you still had grandma yeah. to look after us and try and keep things together. And you still had my old pop, and I can still see him today, trying to prevent us from going down the tube. Wow. Yeah. Um, 100 kilometers away to the nearest police station. So when I look back and to what I know now, there was bits and pieces that was something that I would cherish, mm -hmm. but in the main, it was not a nice place. Wow. Um, because of all of that. I think that that is the, some of the parts that overtake, you know, the, the good part and the richness that can come about from living in a, in a remote community um, where you've got a good family, solid family structure. Yeah. But I grew up in the time when grog started to infiltrate. Yeah. And as a little kid, uh, my memories uh, are not good. Yeah. Let's jump forward in your life story. At, at 15, you're chosen to play football for, for the Australian uh, juniors. How did that happen? It was just amazing because uh, the New Australian government set up some hostels around uh, uh, Australia to give remote kids a chance at education. But I'd grown up in Wilmaringle and uh, my community was affiliated with the Catholic Church in those days. So we got to go to a Catholic boarding school after a year six. So I'd already had a, a, a bit of a stint at boarding school, um, but I felt, still felt lost. Mm. And I felt, still felt like I wasn't able to just uh, fly. And as a kid on, on any mission, uh, rugby league is a dream. Uh, we grew up listening to the radio we had no TVs, but our families used to gather around cars, a car and turn the ABC on, listen to the footy. So I always wanted to be an NRL player. It was just the dream. And you can hear kids talking about that even today. I was no different. Mm. And so when we got the opportunity to go away to school, I always felt this is my chance uh, to go away and show people what I can do. It was the greatest thing because you got selected. Yeah, But the most important p person in my life wasn't there. My mum died when I was a young kid. Oh, so by the time I could fly and really show people what I can do as a player, the one person I really wanted to be there wasn't there. Mm. So there was this 
mixed up young boy who would just go and play the best I could, but look in the grandstand or around car parks, looking for my mum mm -hmm. to be there to say, well done, son. She wasn't there. It was just it was propelling me to be the best I could. Yeah. So in effect, I could really play, but something was holding me back. Yeah. So for you as a young man, sport and sporting success was sort of a bittersweet experience. It was because I could see um, sport being uh, to, to bring me out of poverty, yeah. very Im impoverished. We had, even though we had work in our remote communities and I can see uh, what my friends, uh, my, my, I can see what my football colleagues uh, and, and our sporting success was bringing about change in their life. And I wanted to pursue that. A lot of my mates, their fathers were Australian players and well-known league identities. And so I had this mixed up world. I can see all that, then I can see my impoverished families back home as well. I can see such disadvantage. And, and so I was torn in many ways about whether I would leave and pursue this or go back home and, and, and put my effort into that. So it was like, at a very young age, I was torn. So your sporting break is going to play for Easts. What was that like, moving to the big city? Well, I think if you were an Aboriginal young footballer um, in my time, Arthur Beaton was the pinnacle. Yeah. He, he was the absolute legend of rugby league. And in our community, he was the icon. So to receive a phone call from Arthur Beetson to say, come and play, for, come and play under me, um, I was on the next plane. Yeah. And because it, it's like a dream to be able to play rugby league on the big stage, but to also to receive that call from such a, a, an icon of the game, someone who says, I know that you, you're, you're good enough to play down here and, and before I retire, I want to coach you. So I was on the plane yeah. um, and I was living in Burke at the time and I know it was like a crossroads in my life too as I, I was getting to that age where if you're going to make it in Sydney, it, it needed to be now. Yeah. And so I received the call at the right time, right age. I was very fit and my mentality was that I wanted to be a, a top level rugby league player. Yeah. So it all collided. And I was playing, uh, I was received that call on one day and a few days later I was in his, in his team running out yeah. at Leichhardt Oval and it was like, I, this is a dream. <laughs> um, but for someone like him to just, yep. to be in the room, to be around, uh, I lived with him as well when I was there. Um, for me that was, I thought, that's where I'm going. What was it like that first day running out? How'd you play? It was amazing because uh, the football stadium was the, the Roosters' home ground and it was going to be opened uh, under our first game. And when I ran out there against South Sydney, I played reserve grade for the Roosters and to run out and just hear the crowd. Yeah. And a few days you know, before that, really, I was back home in, in, in Burke. And so it was just an amazing, amazing experience. And I know even young kids from the country now still talk about when they get a chance to go to Sydney and you hear that same voice and, and that was coming out of me at the same time all those years ago. But I really wanted to play under Arthur and I really wanted to f follow my cousin Ron, yeah. who was a, a legendary rugby league player and he'd come from Burke as well and uh, did well both here in Australia and overseas. And so I had some role models yeah. that I wanted to follow. Sydney life? pretty different from, from the country. How did that affect you? Yeah, m amazingly effective on me, uh, major impact. Uh, I wasn't ready for it. Um, and unfortunately, it can have a negative impact on mm. a young boys from the bush as well, as it will with anybody. But if you're not prepared for it, yeah. um, it can take you down the wrong track. So whilst you sort of want to focus on the things that you came here for, um, I wasn't the first and I won't be the last who, who, who fell, uh, uh, went down the wrong track. Yeah, and, and that was in the area of alcohol, grog, drinking? Uh, at the height of my career, at the height of my opportunity, uh, the, grog's, uh, the grog was there and a major part of it, like it is back in Wilmaringal, in Burke and Bree where I grew up. You know, grog is the major issue for our people and it still is today, um, but it certainly was my issue as well when I went to Sydney. Now that didn't finish your career though, what did? It's, it's like, if you go out and train every day and, you, and your focus is absolutely being uh, the best you can be on the, on the field, you can still, you, can still you, know, go some places. 
But if there's other things that you need to address, you think that you can do it all at a young pl as a young person, you think you can deal with it all. You know, the loss of mum and not having her and the grog and I'm still training hard and I'm still can play, so I'm sure I can get through this. Um, but then injuries come okay. and I broke my arm. So you had time when you don't have all those other things. And for me, the thing that I turned to the most was the grog because there was sit down time, there was a lot of money involved, um, but you find other things to get involved in. And unfortunately for me, Grog was there. Yeah. Your, your career, you only last a couple of years in Sydney, you end up coming back. What's it like coming back? It was like a biggest disappointment. It's like I let so many people down. I, my focus on becoming the best I could be on the rugby league field was, was absolutely a part of my, my old being. It, I trained hard every day, I put so much effort and time and gave up so much, uh, but I was still drinking too much, way too much and when the injuries just took away everything and you think it's just a broken arm, but what it does, it sets you back. Mm. It sets you back beyond other players who are there to, to be the best they can be too. And you, your time in the pecking order is only, there's a little limited time. Yeah. And you can lose that. And I didn't understand it. I just didn't understand how big it, that opportunity was. And um, it's something that I'll always uh, remember as a time when you get this time, don't waste it. Yeah.